Diet soda, the cure for the common cola, or just another guilty pleasure? You'd think this would be a pretty cut and dried case. On the one hand, we've got a fizzy fun candy drink with some questionable numbers on the label, but on the other hand, we've got a fizzy fun candy drink that has, wait, nothing? Well, close to nothing anyway. What could go wrong? Well, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't complicated. Diet sodas don't have the same reputation as lemon cleanses. Chances are if you've opted for a diet drink with friends around, you've gotten more of an earful than a mouthful regarding that sweet treat. Despite having an image as a healthier, tasty beverage alternative, uh, diet sodas have always been challenged by claims of being, well, anything but. What are these allegations? Where do they come from? Well, get cozy, folks. We've got some stories to pour over and a couple of suspects booked in for an appearance tonight. But first... We're taking a look at an issue from a variety of perspectives. Chances are we'll get more than a few answers, so once again, we're not trying to tell you what is or isn't healthy. If you're drinking something, chances are there's a label on the back or a website to learn more information. This is meant to be an unbiased approach to a controversial subject. With that out of the way, let's get into it. Sodas are a sweet drink containing carbonated water and flavoring. I'm told they're a refreshing, crisp beverage, but I wouldn't know personally. I don't touch the stuff. Not hot enough. We'll be focusing on diet sodas particularly for this episode, but it wouldn't be research if we didn't start at the source. So let's briefly skim over the history of carbonated beverages. The first batch of artificially produced carbonated liquids was manufactured in the late 1700s, but hot dang if the Greeks weren't already curious about it 2,000 years before that, after noticing what they thought were medicinal benefits from naturally carbonated water springs. The Greeks, clever as they were, couldn't reproduce the phenomena at the time. Uh, who knows why? I guess they were too busy revolutionizing the realm of art and science. So, a couple of millennia later, in 1767, English separatist, theologian, natural philosopher, and chemist Joseph Priestley accidentally invented it. Psst, a uh, little foreshadowing, this won't be the last time someone accidentally invents something in this video. Naturally carbonated beverages had already existed, mind you, uh, considering not just the spring water mentioned before, but the many fermented alcoholic drinks across history. But Priestley had constructed a lab environment capable of bringing carbonation to water without fermenting a bunch of produce in a barrel. People were pretty excited about this. In fact, in 1775, a Scottish physician named John Newth liked it so much, he said, Hey, I love this machine you've built. Really, I, I love the fizzy water. I do not like the urine taste, though. I, I might try to get the pig bladder out of the blueprints. So he made a better version, because nothing says improvement like, we made it taste less like pee, and sent word to Priestley about his findings. Priestley wasn't thrilled taking personal offense to his original design. I don't have a direct tap on how he responded, but it was sort of like, this doesn't taste like urine, yours tastes like urine. I bet your servants urinated in it. My servants don't do that. Okay, I'm paraphrasing, but that last bit was a true accusation. Naturally, it didn't take too long for the dust to settle and for Priestley to admit that Newth had in fact improved upon his original design. And wouldn't you know it, the world thought so too. So it became wildly popular. As time went on, folks started improving on that design even further, getting creative with ingredients. Sometimes a little too creative with ingredients. Uh-oh. But we're getting a little too close to losing sight of the story. There will be some links to a few videos below if you want more on this part of Soda's history. But for now, let's fast forward a bit to the 19th century. All right, so sodas are great. People love them as a sweet, drinkable treat, but wouldn't we all love to have our cake and eat it too? And eat that cake with soda? Well, never you fear, because along came a Russian chemist named Konstantin Falberg, who proceeded to revolutionize the soda industry with coal tar derivatives. Wait, what? Right, remember when we were talking about accidental discoveries? History will remember Falberg as the man who discovered anhydroorthosulfamine benzoic acid, the compound known best today as saccharin. But it's how he discovered it that's truly wonderful. I'll let the man speak for himself. In an interview he did with Scientific American July 17, 1886, quote, 
One evening, I was so interested in my laboratory that I forgot about supper until quite late and rushed off for a meal without stopping to wash my hands. I sat down, broke a piece of bread, and put it to my lips. It tasted unspeakably sweet. I rinsed my mouth with water and dried my mustache with my napkin when, to my surprise, the napkin tasted sweeter than the bread. I again raised my goblet, and as fortune would have it, applied my mouth where my fingers had touched it before. It flashed upon me that it was the cause of a singular, universal sweetness, and I accordingly tasted the end of my thumb, and found that it had surpassed any confectionery I had ever eaten. I had discovered, or made some coal tar substance which out-sugared sugar. I dropped my dinner, and ran back to the laboratory. Yeah, Fallberg's a taste-first-ask-questions-later sort of guy. Uh, not at all advisable, but dang if I don't respect the chutzpah. But yeah, wash your hands, folks. The good news is, Fallberg's hands weren't covered in a dangerous chemical, but instead the concoction that would later be known as saccharin, a pioneer compound in the world of artificial sweeteners. Artificial sweeteners, or sugar substitutes, are a food additive that has the potential to, through plenty of research and experimentation, replace natural ingredients. The first example of a diet soda was in 1952, where NoCal, a diet drink that you won't find on the convenience store these days, used saccharin as a core ingredient to replace sugar. It was invented primarily as an alternative drink to diabetics, but was shortly thereafter buried under the colossal influence of soda's big league players like Pepsi and Coke as they stepped into the diet soda market. Saccharin may have pioneered the path for artificial sweeteners, but today it is among a variety of options, and it would be almost entirely replaced by aspartame in 1982, as it served to be a more palatable alternative that maintained the same no-calorie benefit. Today, aspartame is joined by other sugar-replacing compounds like stevia or sucralose, but in 1982 it heralded a turning point for the soda industry. Introducing Diet Coke, you're gonna drink it just for the taste of it. Is that what I've been drinking? Yeah. Oh, it's got that new sweetener in it. It's sweeping the planet. Diet Coke and Diet Pepsi would be the juggernauts that gained the most from it. And considering their popularity today, it seems like the switch from saccharin was a smart move. While Coke and Pepsi certainly maintain their spot as the royal family of diet drinks, there certainly is no shortage of options when it comes to sugar-free beverages. Sprite, Fanta, Mountain Dew, Ginger Ale, if there's a fizzy drink behind the counter, then there's an equal chance that there's a diet variant of it as well. But what is it exactly about diet soda that has people concerned? Aspartame or saccharin or what's the other one, sucralose? Yeah. Which, by the way, those have all been shown to like screw up the microbiome. Yeah, those are really bad. Research continues about how these sweeteners affect appetite. Serious conditions such as asthma, lymphomas and leukemia, brain tumors and brain cancer, irritable bowel syndrome, Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis, and epilepsy. Saccharin, during its heyday, wasn't just critiqued for its less than palatable aftertaste. Many also considered it a potential carcinogen, primarily around 1981. Again, smart move Coke and Pepsi, though studies since then have proven those claims to be false. But some things never change. There's still an argument to be made not just over the health benefits to artificial sweeteners, but the health risks. While diet soda may have originally been marketed as an alternative drink for diabetic individuals, rodent studies in recent years have indicated that there's a potential link between diabetes and artificial sweeteners. Though there are also arguments against the nature of these studies, both due to the long-standing argument that rodent studies are not 100% accurate imitations of the human body, and the growing concern over a concept known as reverse causation which supports the idea that those who are aware of their own personal risk towards diabetes or heart stroke will be more likely to drink diet soda, resulting in some of the data being debated on both sides. Another argument relates to how artificial sweeteners affect not just our body, but our brain as well. Our brain has to check in whenever we eat something in order to relay the message to the rest of the body on just how to digest the foreign material. In the case of, say, something sweet, the brain goes, Right, that's going to be high in calories. Better let the pancreas know about that. And the pancreas is like, oh dang, something sweet, eh? All right, I'll get the boys. And the boys are like, we're, we're insulin. We, we store sugar in the cells for energy. 
All right, I ran out of steam with the story, but you get the idea. So what happens when you introduce something that is artificially sweet? Well, the brain calls the pancreas, the pancreas hits up the insulin, and the insulin does nothing because there's no sugar to store. It's like spending the day preparing for a birthday party only to have nobody show up. That might be a fun practical joke to pull the first few times, but scientists think that this kind of regulated trickery could lead to something known as metabolic syndrome, which, when we go down the list of potential conditions, does raise some all too familiar risks, including diabetes, heart disease, and stroke. Another point about metabolic syndrome is the theory that the introduction of this trick of the mind could play a hand in how our bodies metabolize actual calories. All of these concerns certainly lead one to ask, are diet sodas bad for you? Well, if our research has shown us anything today, it's that, above all else, they're certainly not good for you. Because at the end of the day, whether it's got sugar or artificial sweetener or anything in between, soda is a treat. But treats are okay. Rewarding yourself can do a great deal toward personal motivation, and on a purely chemical level, tasting something sweet or sugary can feel pretty dang nice. So if diet soda falls into the same category as regular soda, is there even a reason to drink something sugar-free at all? Well, sure, why not? Bodies are unique, every one of them. Perhaps yours absorbs particular nutrients in a way that would better digest artificial sweeteners rather than raw sugar. I mean, that reason alone is how diet drinks were even marketed in the first place. Though, frankly speaking, no soda is the best kind of soda when we're getting down to the brass tacks on healthy drinks. Just like candy or snacks, there's really no universal benefit to be found in regular volumes. But should you feel guilty about the odd sip here or there, particularly if you've been careful to practice a healthy lifestyle elsewhere in your life, well, really, that's up for you to decide. Treats are not inherently awful things, and the quality of life they can provide are just as measurable as anything else on the label. Just as true as anything in life, moderation is key. You can have your Coke and drink it too. Just maybe not 13 every day, all right? <laughs>